It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? What if God, although cho choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy whom he prepared in advance for his glory? Even us, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. It says, it, it, starting in verse 16, it does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. Meaning, there is nothing about you that can come to God and choose. God has to choose you. It says in verse 18, therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. And he hardens whom he wants to harden. When Christians talk about you have a hardened heart against God, the Bible says that God's the one that hardened it. And then it, it, it even goes on to ask, well, then why does God still blame us? You know, if, if he created this way, how come he blames us? And Paul is saying, who are you to question God? How can the clay question the potter and ask, why have you made me like this? It says, what if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? If he has decided he wants to create you just to destroy you, then he's going to do that. And that's his right. You don't get to question that. And realizing this changed everything about my perspective of God. Realizing this made me see a God who did not desire people to be saved, but instead creates people as puppets, does what he wants with them, and then tells them you're not allowed to question it. That is just in direct contradiction to any kind of a loving, kind um, father God that I was taught growing up in the church. So I was fed one version of God who was a loving father, but I'm learning about this completely different God um, who intentionally creates people to go to hell. That right, who intentionally creates people to go to hell. That right there really shattered my perception of God. It really caused me to start this journey of of questioning what I believed and why I believed it. The second passage that the second passage that really caused me to question the Bible was Psalm 137.9. And you've probably heard it. It's a popular one that is used within the deconstruction community to really talk about these atrocities in the Bible. And it says this, happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Now, it is really important to understand the context of this verse. This is what's known as an imprecatory prayer. Um, it is praying evil against your enemies. It is a lamentation. It is an expression of grief. Basically, what this psalmist is writing is uh, about how they were treated so badly by their enemies, and so they want to repay them for what they've done. Justified by Christians in this way. You know, well, they were just expressing themselves. They weren't actually bashing babies into rocks. They just you know, wanted justice. They wanted revenge. But my problem with that is that this is supposed to be the inspired word of God. All right. Shalom. All praise to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai. Double honor to the apostles and elders of Great Millstone. Shalom to the hopefully elect. This lesson is going to be entitled Christians are disturbed over the Esau thing. Which really, we when we say Christians, we really talk about you so-called white Christians. You are disturbed by the Esau thing. It's messing you with your brain. It's messing you up. You know, and we see one of your representatives here. It's bothering her. Now, this video that you saw in the beginning, the intro, it was from this video right here from the elder brother from GMS Baltimore, Holy Bible Defenders, elder brother Karata Zaba, the head of the camp. The title of the video was White Christian Woman is Disturbed When She Reads Scripture for Herself About the True Power. And the true power is, you know, when you read, read the word power, it goes to the to the uh 
word in the Hebrew, Alahayim, which is another word for God, God's judges, powers. So she was reading the scriptures and she proclaimed and read a few few uh, scriptures. And she said those are the things that, that uh, mess with her faith. When you read in the scriptures or the scriptures that she was talking about, when you analyze them closely, the two random verses she brought out, she brought out Romans 9. Let's see if we can bring it up here. Romans 9, round about verse 16, right? And she also read Psalms 137 and verse 9. Now, I when I watched the video, <clears throat> I recognized those two verses immediately because those are verses that we bring out often. When we're dealing with Esau or Edom, when we're dealing with the Edomites, all right? Not just those two verses, but that whole, you know, five, six, seven, ten verses, whatever, whatever they are. Now, I got this uh, from the comment board, right? Let's blow it up here. From the comment board of that video, you had this one brother. Trust nothing, question everything. Wait until she read Revelation 13 and 10. Now, this brother said that, right? I answered back. I said, trust me, she already has. The two verses she read, she read because of Esau. Romans 9, 13, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. She was reading Romans 9, 16 on camera. Ha ha. Because when you read Romans 16, 9, 16, you didn't just start reading it from there. You read up, up some. You read Romans chapter 9. And it sounds a lot like she probably has heard. A lot of these people have heard what the Hebrew Israelites have been saying about them being Esau and the Edomites. And they're going back and they're checking in the scriptures. Now, and when you bring it out, they may say, oh, that ain't true. We ain't the Edomites, this, that, and the other. But only a diligent individual, only somebody completely stupid, should I say, would not at least go and check for yourselves. We tell you to go and check the scriptures. And I know Romans 9 very good, and that, that, especially that part from Romans 9, 11 on down to the bottom of Romans 9. It's talking about Esau, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. It's also talking about Jacob, the vessels of mercy. So her being disturbed by Romans 9, 16, no, she's not. She's a, that. I mean, I'm sure that's part of it. She realizes that, you know, the most high does what he wants to do. But trust me, the Esau thing is bugging her because when you go further than that, she went on to Psalms 137 and verse nine. Right now, I said here she was reading Romans 9, 16 on camera. Ha ha. Then I put Psalms 137 and seven. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, raise it, raise it even to the foundation thereof. And I said she brought out Psalms 137 and nine, but the context was from verse seven laugh my ass off and that happens to be true she said psalms 137 and 9 you know about dashing children against the stones and maybe that is i'm sure it's upsetting to her but in the context of it romans uh psalms 137 and 7 talked about the children of edom first you have to know whose children being are being dashed on the stones here you have to know who the most high is saying he's hardened and when you read up above each one of these verses that she brought out you see Esau being discussed. This Esau thing is bugging these people. And that's why she's questioning her faith because now she's afraid. She's afraid that what we've been saying is true, <clears throat> that they are in fact the Edomites. And, and you are. Let's dive off into Romans 9 and show you what I'm talking about. So this is up top. This is Romans 9 verse 10. It says, and not only this, we'll start at 9. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. As we know, it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right here, Sarah was the wife of Abraham. And not only this, but when, when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. Now we're on to Isaac. Abraham, then Isaac. Right? Verse 11. For the children being not yet born. Who were the children of Isaac and Rebekah? Jacob and and Esau. So we went from Abraham to Isaac. Now we're on to Jacob. We're going we're gonna to transition to Jacob momentarily. And it's going to discuss Jacob and Esau. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of the Most High, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto the 
unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. Right. Esau came out first. The first came out red all over like a hairy garment. And they called his name Esau. So the elder is Esau. Verse 13, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. You see that? There's no way possible she read Romans just 9, 16 and plucked it out of the blue. No, she read up here first. As a matter of fact, when you read verse 11, verse 11 correlates with what's written in, in verse 16. It wasn't of works, but of him that was doing the calling. It was the one that did the selecting, the choosing. And she's understanding that Edomites, that she's Esau first off. She's afraid that she's Esau. And she understands that the Edomites can't change. No person can change the uh the destination that the most high has set for them now i'm a, before we finish reading i'm gonna go out on a limb and say this if in fact she read those verses and she truly believes what they said although she says it's messing with her faith if she if she really read romans 9 13 and she believed what they said she could be an israelite which is a weird twist in all of this right she didn't buck up against it. She believed so much what it said that it convicted her. And she now questions her faith, which she shouldn't question her faith. She should just question the bullshit that Christianity taught her. As the brother put in his, in his caption, Christianity has given her the spirit of strong delusion. The shit that told you about the most high being a loving God. Well, he is a loving God, but only to the Israelites. This is what you're finding out. And the rest of you Christians, you punk ass Christians, you finding out the same thing, but you, you, you real Edomites, you'll read what it says and you'll deny it. You'll come with your own breakdown. You know that it's all good. Let's keep going. Now, verse 12, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, which was Esau. <clears throat> As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So she read this and then she went on to read the preceding verses which explains to her because when you read this and you read verse 16 you find out when you when you play, take this verse right here out of thin air you can apply your own understanding and say well it didn't mean he really hated him it meant you know kind of how he just he's basically saying you know he loved jacob more but he did love esau too no it doesn't mean that when you read down here it tells you he hardened one and made them the objects of judgment hatred destruction and he loved the other and made him the object object of his mercy and his love which is what she understands as it is written jacob have i loved but esau have i hated and then it goes on what shall we say then is there unrighteousness with the most high god forbid is the most high unrighteous because he can love one and hate the other harden one and you know have mercy on the other it goes on for he said to moses I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Then I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And she goes on saying that the most, you know, that God, that's what she says. He can choose to do whatever he wants. And it's absolutely the truth. And it continues. It's a continuation. So then after all we read all of this, it's a summary. So then it is not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth. But of the most high that show of mercy. It ain't got nothing to do with what you want, what you believe, you Edomites can't be selected. One, five, thousand, twenty, twenty thousand, a million Edomites can't be selected out of the whole group of the hated Edomites to be loved by the Heavenly Father because he made it. He predestined you to destruction already. And she understands that. And the rest of you need to come to that same understanding. And you, too, will jump off the Christianity bandwagon <laughs> back into the sea of iniquity, only to drown in judgment and death. And we love it. Verse 17 says, for the scripture says unto Pharaoh. See, she read this and then she read on down. But she was reading up here. She didn't show you this on camera, but she read. Trust me, we know you devils and we know this word you read up here and you read about Esau. And what proves it even further, the next verse you brought out was Psalms 137. And it also talks about Esau in the verses up of above verse nine. But you didn't want to admit it, but you didn't have to. We got it through discernment. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of the most high that show of mercy. For the scripture says unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So it used an example of Pharaoh, how the most high raised up Pharaoh, 
and the Egyptians and he punished them. He didn't save any of them. He punished them. Right. And it just so happens that America is spiritual Egypt and the so-called white man represents the modern day Pharaoh. And we don't care if you don't believe it. Verse 18 says, therefore, therefore is not a word you start off with unless it's describing something that was previously written. All of this, therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardeneth. See that? So the most I can harden those who he hates so that he can he can destroy them. Not let them repent. Don't put it into their program that they should repent that they could find righteousness one day no you can't it's not in you see and those he's going to show mercy it's not in them that they could cast off that mercy it's just the way that it is sure you can point to so-called negroes and say well they grow weed and they do this and they make crack rocks and it's black on black crime and they do this and do that sure you could point to all of that still going to get the mercy we're in your fucked up system you was the one that allowed the drugs to come over here see no matter what you do pointing at us, you're way more guilty because the Most High made you the objects of wickedness and his destruction, and you have done a very good job. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? How can he blame us? We the Edomites, he made us be like this. But we already, you already understood, and we read that he can harden whom he will, have mercy on whom he will, it's all about what he wants to do, not, not what you want to do or what you want. <clears throat> Thou will say then unto me, why does he yet find fault? For who have resisted his will? We got free will, brother. Free will. We can do whatever we want to do. No, you can't. The most High put that on you. And once his destiny is set, his predestination is set, you can't change it. Nay, but old man, who art thou that replies against the most high? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? Well, you made us the Edomites, God. You got to give us mercy. It's not our fault. You made us, made us do wickedness. Yeah, but that's what he wanted to do. Hath not the powder, potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel under honor and another under dishonor? The most I took a lump of clay, broke it in two or in threes. The first lump, Jake, Isaac and Rebekah. From that lump, he brought forth Jacob. From one people, Esau, the progenitor of the other people. One of the vessels was, was under honor. The other was under dishonor. Nobody can change that. Nobody can change it. Some of the vessels of dishonor are not going to suddenly one day awaken to righteousness and become vessels of honor. They wasn't for prepared for that purpose. An ashtray one day is not going to decide to become a microwave oven and change itself. It just doesn't happen. It can't happen. Let's read it again. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel under honor and another under dishonor? You brothers and sisters out there realize this. This is not a random verse. These are not random scriptures. All of it is going back to what we read up here. This is when it started. It started out talking about the children of the most high versus the children of, you know, children of the promise versus the, uh, the children of the seed versus the children of the flesh. However, it was spoken. And then it went into Jacob and Esau. And it's continuing on. Her reading verse 16, trust me, she was she was studying about Esau. And it messed her brain up. And she's hurt. Now, the thing is this, like I said, if she really believes what the scripture says, she's probably an Israelite. And she doesn't understand that because the skin color demon from Babylon the Great is in her mind. Or maybe she just does understand. She could, she could understand that she's an Edomite and still be a damn Esau. She could, you know. I ain't going to give her no coupons. Fuck it. Doesn't matter to me. Verse 22. Back in 21. Had not the potter power over the clay of the same lump that made one vessel under honor and another under dishonor. So the two vessels, the one the most high loves is the vessel of honor, Jacob. And the one that he hated is the vessel of dishonor, Esau. <clears throat> he goes on in verse 22. What if the most high? Willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endure with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. This verse is talking about Esau mainly. What if the Most High to show everybody his power and his wrath? He endured with much long suffering all that bullshit that Esau even been doing killing, maiming, torturing, sacrificing false gods, idols, 
drugs, right? Ever since Cain came on the scene, generation after generation after generation of evil and wickedness and treachery and blood bloodshed and slaughter, maiming, alphabet people, drug use, all types of debauchery on the planet. The Lord has allowed it and watched it and, and put up with it. You see, how's he going to make his power known? By fucking destroying these people. Wonderfully destroying Babylon the Great. That empire that they built up with iniquity, he's going to topple it. It's already begun. We've been preaching and prophesying against this place. And these people are messed up. They threw. Verse 23 let me go back to verse 22. It says, and do it with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us whom he hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. What Gentiles? The ones that are brought forth, the Israelites that were scattered through the anger of the Lord through the diaspora all over the earth these are those gentiles that speaking of because it proves it in the next verse as he saith also in oc i will call them my people which were not my people people and her beloved which was not beloved see that and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them ye are not my people there shall they be called the children of the living god where can we find this at this is in hosea 1 Let's just go to it. <clears throat> Reading this slow on purpose. Hosea 1 and 10. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, unto who? Who's them? The children of Israel. In the place that it was said unto them, ye are not my people. There it shall be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. It's, it's too plain. It's right there. So these vessels of mercy, right, that's going to come from the Jews and the Gentiles is all Israelites. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And this is in the book of Romans. Who are these? And it goes on here to describe what's in Hosea. That in the place where we said unto them, you are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. And then it goes on further talking about the Israelites right here. You can't get caught up in this verse right here. It's talking about Israelites, the Jews from the Holy Land prior to the scattering, prior to the dispersion. And after that dispersion, the Gentiles, Israelite foreigners is right there. Plain black and white, plain blue and white. That's all that you that's all that it is. It's all Israelites. As a matter of fact, when this book of Romans was written, it was written to. Who was it written to? It said even us hath called. So that's to Romans, right? Romans one and one. Paul, a servant of Yahweh Shah Hamashiach, called to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of the Most High. Verse 6, uh, verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of the Most High, called to be saints. Who is this right here? Who is this? This is Psalms 48. Well, I'm sorry, Psalm 50. Let's just go right to the point. Who are the saints? Called to be saints. I should have went to verse 5. Psalms 50 and 7. Psalms 50 and 5. Excuse me. Gather my saints together unto me. Those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Who is that? Who is the covenant with? It was the Israelites. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am the Most High, even thy God. There it is. Boom. So the saints are Israelites. And the book of Romans was written. To all that be in Rome, beloved of the Most High, called to be saints. It's all Israelites. There's no way around it. So you can see that she was reading Rome, Romans 9 and she read up here. And then she got to verse 16. And then now I say this in true Edomite fashion. She lied and said, you know, she was reading verse, verse 16 is really what got on, got on her nerves. Because of some fucking babies being dashed on stones. No, she read about the revenge. The revenge that's going to come on the eat them and then their babies being dashed to stones. Because when you go here, up top is talking about the uh, the captivity and the experience of the captivity. She ain't, she ain't upset about the captivity about the Israelites. She was upset with verse 9. The whole thing is talking about the, the captivity of Esau, of the uh, Salakia, the captivity of, of Jacob, 
right? Going to Babylon and all that. She ain't mad about none of that. She heard about verse nine. No, bitch, you heard about verse seven through nine. Let's read it. Psalms 137 and seven. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom. You think she, you really think she read just verse nine alone by itself? Is that what you think? Especially after she read Romans nine and what she said, 16. No, Esau was talked about in that verse too. The Esau thing is bugging her. See it? She's realized that the Edomites can't make it, that the Most High's true intention to do as he pleases, and that they have no authority. She's hurt, as the rest of the Christians are. And the black, so called black Christians, are trying to help these fucking devils get out of the pit. You can't help them. And as a matter of fact, as a bonus, the Most High gonna destroy your black ass for trying to help them, and then you'll come back in the kingdom. Unavoidable mercy. We almost wish there was a hell so you could go there and burn with these devils. But it ain't going to be no hell. Hell is going to be the lake of fire right here in Babylon the Great once it's lit on fire. Psalms 137 and 7. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, raise it, raise it even to the foundation thereof. So the subject here is the children of Edom. O daughter of Babylon, not, not ancient Babylon, but the daughter of Babylon, which is America, Babylon the Great. The Edomites are there. The Israelites are there. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. You see that? So the man that sees you get served the way we got served is going to be happy. Then you go to verse 9. So, so far, children of Edom, daughter of Babylon, happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. And then she mentioned they're talking about retribution and revenge. See? That's what she's saying. So she read Psalms 137 and 7 through 9. And, and, and the funny thing is this. When we break this down and we prove who Esau is today, we go to Psalms 137 and 7 through 9. And we go to Romans 9 to tell, you know, 9 through 11, 9, 11, down, down to the bottom where we read to, to prove that the Most High does in fact hate Esau. So to go behind us and read what we read and then it, you, you understand it. Hell yeah, you get it. And now we let's go to Psalm. Let's go to uh, Isaiah. Excuse me. Excited. Isaiah 47. Tie in the daughter of Babylon now with the Israelites. Because we tied in the daughter of Babylon with, with uh, the, the children of Edom. Now let's tie in the daughter of Babylon with the Israelites. Isaiah 47 and 1. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. You see it? Daughter of Babylon. Verse 6, let's go to. So when it says sit on the ground, it means the kingdom is being brought down to a low state. Verse 6, I was wroth with my people. The most high, the, the root word or the word wrath in the present tense, but it wrath in the past tense. I was angry. I had wrath with my people. I have polluted mine inheritance. What's the most high's inheritance? Jacob. Jacob is the lot. Let's go there real quick. Deuteronomy 32 and 9. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. See that? So when the Lord says, I have polluted my inheritance, he means his people, Jacob. I was wroth of my people. I was angry at the Israelites. I have polluted my inheritance and given them into thine hand. Thou didst show them no mercy. He gave into the hand of the daughter of Babylon. We read in Psalms 137 and 130, 137 and 7 through 8 that the children of Edom and the daughter of Babylon are mentioned together. I was wroth with my people. I have polluted my inheritance and given them into thine hand. Thou didst show them no mercy. Did the Edomite show us mercy? No. Upon the ancient hast thou very heavily laid thy yoke going into slavery going into bondage going against you know or going into having everything against us the way that they treated us and she knows this she knows this she knows it she knows it and she is afraid all messed up let me check the time and i'm gonna read one more scripture real quick right here and then we'll end the lesson so we got the children of israel in bondage under the children of edom in the daughter of babylon you can't get out of it. And to show you that the end, 2nd Ezra 6 and 7, 
the end time empire of the Edomites. That's, that's who's in power at the end of the world. Then answered I and said, Second Ezra 6 and 7, what should be the parting asunder of the times? What's the parting asunder of the times? It's the end of the world. A when shall be the end of the first and the beginning of it that followeth? When is the end of the world coming? And when is the new world going to begin? And he said unto me, From Abraham unto Isaac, when Jacob and Esau were born of him, Jacob's hand held first the hill of Esau, for Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followed. That we are tied together at the hip. We're in your hand. Your world ends. Our world begins. We can go real quick. Second Ezra chapter seven. The day of doom is the end of this time. It is the beginning of immortality. Second Ezra chapter seven, around about forty-four. Yeah, 43, 42. He answered me and said, This present life is not the end where much glory doth abide. Therefore have they prayed for the weak. But the day of doom, what's the day of doom? When the nuclear destruction of Babylon comes, judgment day. But the day of doom shall be the end of this time and the beginning of the immortality which is for to come wherein corruption is past. There you go. So the day of doom is the end of this world. And the beginning of the immortality, which Jacob's world comes at the end of Esau's world. We just read it. Second Ezra 6 and 9. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it. That follows. So she knows this. She's seen it. The main thing, them, them verses that we talked about. These damn devils, you ain't slick. And what we told you to read that, though. We wanted you to read it. We knew you would read it and get all messed up and panicky. I want to see what the good news translation is. 6 and 7 through nine when we end it abruptly afterwards second address from the good news translation chapter six <clears throat> verse seven then i asked how long of a period of time will divide the ages when will be the when will the first age end and the next age be the interval so like you the interval will be no longer than between abraham and abraham he was the grandfather of both Jacob and Esau. And when they were born, Jacob was holding Esau's heel. Esau represents the end of this age. And Jacob represents the beginning of the new age. Woo! This Edomite thing is bugging you. It's disturbing you. It's robbing you of sleep. And we love it. Lord, when it was edifying, brothers and sisters, all praise to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai.